I'm Felix Clock with the Rust platform team at Amazon Web Services, and I'm going to be showing you a demonstration of the console application that's been being developed by the Tokyo team. Um, the console is an application for giving you insight into the behavior of a uh, task runtime, in particular the Tokyo runtime for doing asynchronous Rust. Um, in principle, the console actually can be deployed to be give insight into other kinds of task runtimes. For example, we've seen it demonstrated on the Rayon um, computational task scheduler. But uh, the, for our, our initial focus, especially for the first release, is just going to be on the Tokyo runtime. To demonstrate the console, I'm going to use a toy program that is um, included with the console source code, namely this little application. Um, it's just called app.rs in the Tokyo examples, or in the console examples. And all it's going to do, the heart of it is going to be uh, this, these bits of code here. It's going to spawn off two tasks, this one here on line 51, and then another one here on line 52, and then it's going to wait for both those tasks to finish. And each of those tasks, when they run, all they're going to do, down here on line 73, is they're just going to spawn off other tasks. And it's going to, they're going to vary this value for i, where i is a number of seconds. And they're going to spawn off a task that just sleeps for that number of seconds by calling this wait function, this wait asynchronous function here. And so they're first going to spawn off a task that waits for a number of seconds. And then the task itself is going to wait for a different number of seconds by taking the max value and subtracting the value for i. And it just does this over and over again in a tight loop. So the effect is you spawn off something that waits, you wait a while for yourself, and then you spawn off another one that waits, and so on and so forth. Um, and you just keep doing it over and over again, varying the value of i from min to max, and then min to max, min to max again and again and again as you go through the outer loop. OK, so let's run this program and see what happens. So. When I run it, I see no output, and that's entirely expected. This program doesn't do anything. It has, doesn't having to print the screen or even take input from the user. It's just spawning tasks. However, something I didn't show you is that the very beginning of my function, I, we, I did add this line, console subscriber init. And this is the, uh, the bit of plumbing that lets this program interface with the console I'm about to demonstrate. By adding this one line to the code, I have now enabled it to talk to the console. And what does the console look like? Well, if I run it, it looks like this. This is just like the top output in Unix for a table of processes, except here I'm showing you a table of tasks. So we're seeing all the tasks that are running within the Tokyo runtime for the program that I just demonstrated to you. We can go ahead and choose different tasks by using the arrow keys to go up and down. Uh, we can choose different columns to sort by. So right now I'm sorting by the task ID. I can hit I to invert the sort, the sort order. Um, so now it sorts from lowest to highest. And so we see task IDs one and two at the top. I can hit the right arrow key, left and right arrow keys to choose a different column to sort by. So I can see, for example, um, which tasks are the most idle um, or least idle. And in fact, I can also go and select particular tasks, like task ID 2 here, hit enter, and actually see a detailed view for that task, where I get a histogram of the poll time. So each time that the Tokyo runtime um, invokes a task to have it do some work, that is a call to poll. So I can do that and see how the times are distributed, distributed for those different calls to poll. I can see the number of times it's been woken up and the, and the uh, percentile showing the max poll time at the different percentile values. And the other thing I want to mention is out of the box, these tasks also have the source code file and line number where that task was spawned, which means that I can immediately correlate um, where this task came from with this output here. So this task with task ID 1 came from app no names line 51. And if I look and jump to line 51, we see that is the exact line of code where we spawned off this first task. And likewise, task ID 2 corresponds to line 52 in our code right here. And finally, we see a bunch of tasks at the bottom that all say line 73. 
which, as you might have guessed, corresponds to the tight loop of these calls to spawn with weight. So it's a little awkward to just talk about things in terms of file, file names and line numbers. It's certainly useful that we get this out of the box without having to do anything else besides adding this one line of code right here. But in practice, for a demonstration like this, it's a bit more useful to be able to name things. And so to demonstrate that, I'm going to make use of a newer Tokyo feature where everywhere that I've called Tokyo spawn in the original code that I showed you, I'm going to replace those calls. For example, this call to Tokyo spawn here is being is now going to be replaced with a call to a task builder where I can now give it a name like norm task one or norm task two and then spawn it off. And that's the only change that I'm making between the old version of the code that I showed you already and the new version of the code that I'm going to show you now. And it's worth noting that these names that I give it can be constructed on the fly dynamically. So earlier, the name that I showed up above, these are you know constant strings that I use for norm task one and norm task two, and that works fine. But if you happen to want to create your name dynamically, you can do that too. And here I'm encoding the number of seconds for the wait call into the name and using that as the name for the task. So if I run this version of the application, and then I call and I run the console, now I see very much the same interface that I saw before, except now we have interesting, useful values for the task name fields over here on the right-hand side, which means that as I'm talking to you about these tasks, I can do things like say, hey, look at norm wait 11, and say, ah, this is the one that has a call to wait 11. That's how this thing was built over here. And you can look and see, yep, the idle time is going up. And then as soon as the idle time goes up past 11, the task completes. That's what these things do. They just wait for that number of seconds. And then once they finish doing that, they're done. And so we can likewise see this happening for these other tasks, like norm wait 9, where it's just going to sit idly. It's not being woken up because it's, it's still in the wait state. But as it goes up and eventually hits 9 seconds, it gets woken up, and then it finishes, and it's completed. OK, so this is the kind of exploration you can do with a tool like this. When your pr program is behaving normally, you can try to learn more about it by using a tool like this to explore its behavior. But of course, a debugging tool or just any kind of investigation tool, you often find that when you really want them to work for you is when there's something that's behaving oddly, or there's something that's behaving in a way you didn't expect. So in order to demonstrate that in this case, I'm going to rerun the same program again except this time I'm going to inject some um, misbehaving or at least oddly behaving tasks. I'm doing that here by just passing some command line parameters that spawn off some additional tasks with admittedly um, some names that give us a bit of a hint as to what they're doing. So if I now reattach here, uh, you'll now see that there are some new names, some new tasks with, a pro with corresponding names in them. But what I want us actually to focus on is on the interesting characteristics of these tasks. Because in practice, when something's wrong, you're not going to have useful names to tell you that something's wrong. You're going to have to figure it out from what they're doing. For example, this burn task here, you'll see has the highest number of poles. And it keeps going up, up, up. And the question you might ask yourself, what is going on here? In fact, now we just got passed by Hyper, so that's not actually true. Because <laughs> um, Hyper is interacted. Hyper is a web server, and it's being used to interact as the basis for this console application. Um, so the fact that there's interactions in this console with Hyper means that the number of poles there surpasses this. But in terms of the um, tasks for our application, burn definitely takes the cake in terms of number of poles. Compared to t norm task 1 and norm task 2 that only have 11 or 4 poles, um, this has way more, 98. And if we go in and look at it, you can see the histogram for it shows a whole bunch of poles, um, you know, as many as 21 for a given time slice. But they're all, mo the vast majority of them are very, very short. Um, and so you might ask, what is happening here? And to answer that question, you can look at the spawn location, um, line 39 of the app. If we go there, we can find there's the call to burn, named burn as we, as we might expect. And then if we look at what burn does, all it's doing 
is it's running a tight loop where it just yields to the scheduler um, for Tokyo and then uh, goes through the loop again and yields again. So you have this bouncing back and forth where the scheduler is running, pulling the task for a very short amount of time, you know, basically the time that it takes to get to the yield function again, and then it yields back to the scheduler again. So that explains why we see this distribution of time. We do see some calls that are longer because some of the pull calls are going to go, go through the, at this loop ends, they're going to go through the sleep call here. And so that's going to correspond to a longer period of time, but then it's going to go back into this loop again, and it's going to end up doing a bunch of um, short-lived yields. Okay, so that's sort of an interesting uh, piece of behavior that we can observe by looking at the histogram like this. Another task that I want to show you is the blocks task. So this task is interesting because if we sort by the busy time for our tasks, you'll notice that there's a huge outlier. This blocks task has a time, a busy time, that's measured in seconds, 66 seconds, versus the, all these other ones are measured in milliseconds or microseconds. So what's happening here? Why is this task such an outlier with the amount of busy time? And you know, you could say, well, we could look at the details view and see if we learn anything from that. And all we really see here is there's a very uniform histogram um, of poll times, which is kind of interesting, but doesn't really answer the question of what is happening. So in order to answer the question here, we need to dig into the code a little bit, but we have our source line number. We can go to line 29 of the app. And from there, we can follow through to what the actual code is doing, double sleepy. And here's our answer. What this code is doing is it's an accidental call to thread sleep instead of Tokyo's sleep method. And what that means is, since it's going to call the thread sleep method, it's basically going to block this thread from making any progress. Um, and so instead of being able to yield back to the Tokyo runtime and let it schedule the thread from doing something more useful, instead it's just going to be busily waiting for this thread to finish its call to sleep. And so that's um, a sort of wasted effort in terms of what, if you wanted to maximize the amount of use of threads within the Tokyo runtime itself, you want to avoid these kinds of calls. Um, you want to use Tokyo sleep instead of standard thread sleep. And so that's reflected here by the amount of busy time that's um, being associated with this task. And the last task I want to talk to you about is the coma task. Um, so it's interesting because if we sort by the number of poles, we'll see that this one has a poll time of one. Now there's lots of tasks that have poll times of one, namely all of the norm weight tasks also similarly have a poll time of one, but you'll notice they all have a poll time of one with an idle time that's relatively short, right? Typically less than 10 seconds or up to 12 seconds in the case of when you have something that's waiting 12 seconds, but they're all going to be less than certainly 30 seconds, while coma has an idle time of hundreds of seconds. You might ask, what is happening here? Why is this thing uh, sitting there saying it's got one single pole and this huge idle time? And a piece of insight you can get from the console right here is I can look at the other ones, like norm weight. We'd see they have one waker. They are waiting to be woken up. Um, this is the norm weight task. It's waiting to be woken up when it hits the idle time of 14 seconds. If we compare that to coma, it has no wakers. So there's an invariant in Tokyo that whenever you uh, yield from a future where you, where you want to schedule a task to be re a future to be rerun in the future, a task to be repolled in the future, you're supposed to also schedule a waker to do that awakening. You're supposed to set things up so that you always set up a waker to signal to a task that it's time for it to resume doing some work. And this task breaks that invariant. So if we look at the source code, and so that's reflected here, first of all, in the fact that there's zero wakers registered. And if we look at the source code at line 34, we'll see the code that's doing this, namely this call the future pending without doing any kind of registering of a waker before calling pending. Okay, and so that is the heart of the console as it stands today. Now there are some other features that we have planned. Um, the big ones are, I showed you lists of tasks, but another big one that we really want to make sure we get in um, is being able to also list resources and specify the relationships that tasks have with resources. So for example, a channel is an example of a resource where you might want to be, you're waiting on a message from a channel. And so that's where could be represented as saying a task is blocked on a channel because it's sitting there waiting for a message to come from it to the task. 
also a task could be waiting for a channel to send to a channel. A channel could be filled to capacity while it's waiting for another task to, to pull messages off the top of it. And so another task that's sending messages could be blocked because the channel is filled to capacity. And these are the examples, the examples of the kind of questions that we want you to be able to answer by using the console, by being able to go into a task in the task detail view of a task, and then somewhere in this interface, seeing a list of the resources that it currently owns or is blocked on. Um, another crucial feature that we're going to um, need to add is you may have noticed that in some cases I was sort of timing my choice of when to visit certain tasks here because when you have things that are running live, suddenly tasks can die and become completed on you while and you missed your chance to sort of investigate what was going on in that point in time. And so a feature that we want to make sure we have is the ability to pause the incoming event stream so you can investigate what's happening at a certain point in time without worrying about the thing updating live um, and just disrupting your workflow. And we also want to be, have the ability to rewind, to be able to actually go back in time and investigate the state of the system um, earlier in the event, event stream and then replay from there. So those are some example um, features that we are currently working on specifying and designing and then implementing. Okay, so with that having been said, I want to thank you for the time you spent watching this demonstration. And uh, yeah, we hope it is useful for you to either learn more about um, your, your uses of Tokyo, either as an expert or as someone who's just learning about async programming in general. All right, thank you for your time.